step outside. Ah, uh, yet hey, everybody, welcome this evening to our uh, Wisdom Circle event. We are so excited that we're having this event here tonight. We got a lot to share with you, and we just want to start off our evening by acknowledging our traditional ancestors all over Mother Earth, particularly right now where we're at here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We'd like to uh, acknowledge the Ogo, o, Oga Poge Owinge, also known as Santa Fe, where we reside. And uh, this evening is super special because we have Ramona Emerson. <laughs> Ramona is, amongst many things, is a Navajo filmmaker, creative writer. Uh, she's a mother, she's a wife, she's a She's a worker bee, and tonight we're really excited to celebrate her, uh, I want to say new novel, but it's probably an old novel that finally got uh, published, but we'll talk about that. It's called Shudder, and Ramona got published by Soho Press Incorporated, and she got distrib she's getting distribution through Penguin Random House. And what's so beautiful about Ramona is she is an indigenous community member who advocates for uh, her for indigeneity and passes on her knowledge gifts and skills to give back to her communities in ways that really break down stereotypes cultural appro cultural appropriation and overall misunderstanding of what it is to be indigenous on turtle island and ramona is living proof that we all need to stay with our visions we need to continue to dream and we need to write our stories. So join us this evening. Let us all welcome Ramona Emerson. All Yay! right. Ramona, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, everyone. It sounds like quite the party. <laughs> uh, uh, well, she, Ramona Emerson is she. Uh, and uh, I am originally from Tohatchi, New Mexico, and I have uh, lived also in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, where I reside now. And I run a production company here in Albuquerque with my husband, Kelly Byers, called Real Indian Pictures. So we work mostly in documentary work, and um, we do a lot of work for um, Native organizations and universities. And um, that's how that's how we make our money so that we can make documentary films. <laughs> and um, I, geez, I guess I've been making films for a while, over 25 years. Um, I'm, I like to make films and tell stories. I'm not a good marketer, <laughs> which probably is why I haven't seen a lot of my films. I'm, I'm not really good at that side of it, but, um, but we continue to make, um, like you say, Tosh, um, content that aims to um, rehumanize Indigenous people um, through our own stories, right? Because I think after years of being objectified um, by the cinematic space, I think, um, through people who were making films about us um, in our communities. And, um, you know, it's, it's 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 a very difficult um, it's a very difficult medium to be a part of. It's it's uh, hard to make a good living being a filmmaker, especially a documentary filmmaker. Documentaries aren't blockbusters by any um, any stretch of the imagination. So you really have to be devoted to your story and um, to what you're trying to bring across with the story you're making. And in the case of um, in the case of uh, documentary work, I think it's just really all about remembering that you are given the responsibility of telling the story. Um, people are trusting you with their words. They're trusting you with their images. Um, they're trusting that you are going to get their story across the way they want you to tell it. And that's a big responsibility. Uh, so I think that as a storyteller, I think that's really most important. But as an advocate, it's even more important to make sure 
that you give the next generation of filmmakers opportunities, advice, um, help, um, whatever you can do so that they can, t can continue that work and continue to make space for ourselves in our own community because it continues to be a struggle to get funding and to tell these stories from our perspectives. Uh, outsiders continue to be funded and supported to tell our stories. And we, you know, kind of have to fight tooth and nail as indigenous people in this particular country for for documentary funding and for funding in general. There's a very limited amount of funds and all the filmmakers know each other and know each other's work and we're all competing for the same five pieces of pie every year. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard business to be in. Um, but I am looking forward to moving into, into the business of writing instead of, you know, the business of hauling equipment around and, uh, you know, uh, looking for funding and begging for money and writing grants and that kind of thing. It's hard. It's hard to do that work and it's hard to maintain a lifestyle, uh, you know, a healthy lifestyle making those kind of, uh, those kind of career choices, which is why I think my husband and I have this business. Because like I say, it's our bread and butter. So we're able to make all kind of making documentaries for everybody else in their programs and doing college campus tours or whatever they need and using that money a lot of times to fund our own work and to help us survive and eat and take care of our son <laughs> um, while we make these documentaries. So I've been, you know, I've been part of that story, uh, storytelling family, I guess, for years. Um, I come from a, a, a whole family of storytellers, and, and my mother and my grandmother, my grandma was an educator, and um, she was a huge influence on me. She went back to school, she went back to college in 1986. She was uh, 70 years old, <laughs> um, and she told me if I can go back to school and go to college, I remember I was probably about 13, something like that, when she graduated, and she told me if I can, some old lady like me can do it, she kept telling me, I can, you can do it too, there's no excuse, and she came to UNM, and she lived in the dorms just like everyone else, and um, it's an inspiring thing to see somebody after she raised all of us, including her grandkids, <laughs> um, she finally went back and did what she always wanted to do, which was to be a teacher. And I, I pull a lot of inspiration from her and also from our shared love of movies. I think my, my aunt or my grandmother and my mother both had um, a love of film and movies, different genres maybe. Um, but um, and reading. Also, my grandma really encouraged me to read, and she's the one that taught me to read when I was very young. And so we shared that interest and that love of storytelling and talking about books. And my grandma and I used to recite The Giving Tree and Peter Rabbit <laughs> and Where the Wild Things Are when we were when I was little because I knew those stories so well because my grandma and I would you know, read them all the time. And so that whole part of storytelling, that whole part, that idea is really ingra was ingra ingrained in me with my grandma. And like I say, my grandma and my family are big storytellers. And a lot of the stories that we started, we started with are um, scary stories. I think a lot of the stories that were told to me by my cousins and my uncles and my aunties and um, growing up were scary stories, right? Meant to scare us into doing what we were supposed to be doing and not doing what we shouldn't be doing. Um, and so we just kind of grew up kind of trying to outdo each other, trying to scare each other with whatever story we could, you know, you know you're not supposed to talk about that. Or if you whistle at night, they're going to come for you and have all my little cousins out there. They're going to come for you and then start whistling and they all run for the house. <laughs> That kind of stuff, you know, I mean, that was just part of growing up was having that storytelling. But my grandmother and my mother also had a love of the film, of her, um, films, and I, I shared a lot of watching a lot of old westerns with my grandma. She really loved Gary Cooper, and we watched a lot of Gary Cooper westerns, and 
She also loved Clint Eastwood and Charles Bronson's, which were which were kind of like those Death Wish movies, and you know, like um, Clint Eastwood and you know all of those really bad 70s movies where he's Dirty Harry and Magnum Force and all that stuff. My grandma was really into that, and um, we would we would go to those movies and we would we would really enjoy them and. My mom, in the same way, was a big horror movie fan, so I've seen like every single bad horror movie that's probably ever been made. Um, I was taken to The Exorcist, so I hear when I was an infant, <laughs> and I slept through it. So, like, they've been taking me to bad, scary movies since my infancy, and so it's kind of just part of me. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of that's kind of where, and I think my mom being a painter and being an artist kind of also influenced me in, in some ways, I think, because I kind of knew, she prepared me for a life of being an artist, because I understood pretty early on um, that being an artist wasn't an easy thing, and that you had to work really hard to do it, and that you had to, you had to sacrifice, you had to not make money, <laughs> there was just a lot of things that I knew that if I was going to do this, that my mom already kind of ingrained it in me that that's fine if that's what you want to do, but you're going to, but at least I knew that that's the kind of lifestyle I was, I was getting ready for. And also I think just her ability to, cause you know, she, she does a plain air landscape painting. And I feel like I have a little bit of her eye, a little bit of her, um, of her framing, like, there's something about the way you look at things and the way you frame your life and the way you frame the things around you. And I think by watching her paint and watching her be a part of that process and cause I've been watching her since I was a kid. Um, so that whole idea of the, the, you know, the look, what you, uh, what you put out there um, really, really does make a big, big influence. And my mom knew that. She did art that was not considered Indian art, and, and she couldn't sell it. And she would always say to me, well, if I painted a sheep, if, if I went out and did this plein air landscape and it was beautiful, nobody's going to buy it. But if I paint all a sheep and a hogan and some Navajo stuff in it, then they will, because they expect a certain thing from me as a Navajo woman, as a painter. They expect a certain thing. And she refused to give it to them. And yeah, when I was a kid, I would be upset with her because I think that I felt like we were made to suffer so that she could have artistic integrity. I don't know. I just kind of felt like that was what it was like. But growing up and being an artist, I see what she, I see why she did what she did. And I'm proud of her for not selling out. I'm proud of her for standing strong and continuing to this day to do the same work that she wants to do and not letting other people or money dictate what direction she would go in and so um I think that was a big influence on me because I feel like I take that same kind of I, I kind of take that same kind of path that she does you know like I I understood that you know what you're trying to do and the the message you're trying to get across and the responsibility of the people whose story you're telling is much more important than how much money you get or what opportunities are going to be handed to you. That's not why you make art. You don't make art to um, to get rich or to inflate your ego. You make art to make change and to change what change the ideas of people who are looking at your art and participating in your art. So for me, that's I think a big part of why I went I went in the direction I I did and why I continue to work um, in the documentary industry. Yes, that is uh, really good to know about uh, the process of making art. The intention is it sacred or is it monetary? Is it uh, stereotypical what's going to sell or is it uh, your true heart to vision so uh, when you started seeing life through your own lens and I like how you said. Framing because you know when you look through a lens it's a frame, so you can go close, you can go far, you can pan all kinds of stuff. Uh, did you 
when you started to do the images, did you see stories? Did you uh, have stories in your mind or were you just taking pictures? Like we're talking about three different things here. We're talking about you're a photographer, right? You're a photographer, you're a filmmaker, videographer, editor, and you're also a creative writer. And right now you just completed a beautiful novel called Shuttered. It's action packed and uh, crime and scary and horror and all that kind of good stuff. I can't wait to read it. Um, but did you already have stories when you were real young and you started taking pictures? Like when you took a picture, did you have a story? Yeah, I mean, I think I remember I went, I went to, there was an anthropological film school in Santa Fe uh, when I was a little kid. And my, one of my schoolmates named Carolyn, her father, Carol, owned the anthropological film center. And I remember going over there when I was like second, third grade, third grade, and seeing how moving image works because he would just give us like empty cells of film, just unexposed film, and we would go and he would just give it to us and we would draw on each frame and make an animation. So like I made this animation of this fruit bowl with all this fruit in it and then all the fruit crawled out. But I think it was like my first uh, time seeing how the film process worked and understanding that film were film was a collection of images and so like you make 24 frames of an apple and only one second is going to go by and I think it really cemented in my mind the way that film works and how you can do the same thing with photography um, I had my, my stepdad, Will, um, introduced me to a pinhole camera when I was very young, and he took a couple of portraits of me with a pinhole camera, and it was the first time I'd seen any images ever made by, like, this inanimate object and some paper that was in a box, so I had, I didn't even know that you could do that, and they were also making a, a film by using the pinhole camera as each frame so they would pull a camp they would pull it out and expose the paper and then they would do it again he would move and then they would do it again so it was like animating but at a very small long drawn out process through still imagery and it was part of some art thing that they were working on but all of this kind of like i just remember it like it was yesterday because i think it was such a cool thing for me to see that imagery could appear on a piece of paper that easily and that in order to make these images move there was a significant amount of work that went into it so when i watched film from that point on i understood that wow especially animation because i understood that each movement would just just a small movement would take frames and frames and frames and work and work and work and all these people drawing the photos the pictures and so that I think kind of got me ready for it. And I mean, I took pictures. I had a little Insta, um, Instamatic um, camera that my grandma bought me and I would take pictures of everything, all kinds of stuff. I had a little brother um, and I would take a lot of photographs of my little brother um, and my cats, like, oh, my grandma. I just took pictures of everything. And I don't, I mean, my mom kept those photos. I don't even know, for me, it wasn't important. I was just taking photographs. And I once I saw them and I was moving on to something else. Um, but I don't think I realized that I could be a filmmaker. I mean, I thought it was like a pie in the sky dream. And when I was, when I was younger, I wanted to be an astronaut. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a pilot and then I wanted to go into space. Film was very far from my mind. Um, but when I found out my eyes weren't very good and I needed to, I might not be a good pilot because my eyes weren't very good. Um, I kind of got bummed out. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And um, I went to see a Spike. I had been a Spike Lee fan because I had seen She's Got to Have It. And I had seen Do the Right Thing. And I, um, so I had, you know, I had some idea of who Spike Lee was. And I enjoyed his films. And so when I was a junior or a sophomore in high school, uh, my mom took me out of school because I begged her to, and I wanted to go see the new Spike Lee movie, and we went to see Mo Better Blues, which is definitely not one of Spike's better movies. 
very misogynistic kind of a like a lot of his films are but in in particular that one um but the visual and the idea of the passion behind this guy's love of music and how he loved music more than anyone else you know no kid no wife no parents nobody mattered it was all about his music and and it was like this obsessive story about kind of his decline because he was just obsessed but i thought he did he physically and visually embodied the idea of isolation and the idea of just this obsession that he had with his music but he did it visually and he moved a lot of he made a lot of movement in his camera just like he did with do the right thing and i was like it, i think there was a spark in my brain that was kind of like wow um you can actually like affect people's emotions. You can change the way people are thinking and feeling by where you place the camera and how you move it, how you move it. I mean, I'd seen it like with Orson Welles and different people before and I understood the concept, but I really didn't see it in place until I saw that film for some reason. And at that point I was like, I want to be a filmmaker. Um, that's what I want to do because I would love to tell stories that way. And I want to use some cool angles and I want to do some cool visuals. And so for me, that's that's kind of where it started off. Um, but I mean, it was pretty quick. I, I, I realized also that right then and there that I wanted native content. Like, okay, there's there's all these other filmmakers from all over the world that are making awesome content. But where are the native filmmakers making native content? And it was like at that point where I realized there were very few people making content. There was like Diane Reyna who had helped produce Survive in Columbus and Victor Montaespa who made Imagining uh, Indians, right? And other than those two, and I think Beverly Singer had done maybe Sandy Osawa, maybe, you know, and of course, um, uh, Merita Mito. Would, they have all, they had all made some films. I mean, but they weren't mainstream. You couldn't find them anywhere. And I had to get to film school before I saw the actual films. Also, also Arlene Bowman um, made another film at UCLA at the time that I was at film school too. Anyway, so there was, you know, there were very limited um, images of other women uh, from the Native community making films. I mean, literally, they you couldn't even count them on one hand. There was not, there weren't even enough to count on one hand. And that's just another thing that bugs me when, you know, when there's a voice like that. Well, where is that voice? Like, why isn't that voice happening? And now, um, you know, 30 years later, it's good to see that young indigenous women are, there's, you, can, you can't even count them on both hands. There's so many, from so many communities, um, all the way to, you know, around Turtle Island, there's a million women that are making movies. And back when I started, there weren't anybody making movies. There was nobody. <laughs> and there was no opportunity to really make films. You know, oh, and Ava, Ava Hamilton, she was another filmmaker very early on. She helped start the Sundance Native program. You know, and then, and then you know, it just kind of, now it's blowing up. Now it's blowing up, right? It's just in the last couple of years, Natives are given a lot of opportunities to make content. And I'm so happy that it's happened, you know, but... When I started out, I I couldn't even imagine that we could be where we are now. But at the same time, we are so far away so far away from where we need to be. Um, I still think that um, the mainstream media, Hollywood, you know, they still have an idea of who we are as an indig as indigenous people, and they are very much invested in us maintaining the same tropes, maintaining the same ways in which they think of us and our communities. They expect the powwows, they expect the fry bread, they expect us to be living on a reservation in a hogan or in a teepee. They expect these certain things or working in a casino. Like there are just these tropes, I think, that are connected to native communities. And I just feel like as indigenous people, especially here in the US, we need to work on our content and we need to get more um, original content. And that stuff that is completely original and new and some science fiction and some when are we gonna have like 
you know, the native sex in the city or, you know, like, when are we going to have the friends with the nothing but Indians living in an apartment? Like, friends with Indians would be hilarious and it wouldn't be that poot, that cush, right? Nobody would be living in some fancy apartments in Manhattan. The, but that would be way more interesting to me than watching friends. You know, I mean, there's just a lot of, um, there's just a lot of ways that we can change the way that people think about who we are, who we are as a community. And um, we need to work on that still. We still need more work on that. Well, I'm glad you're saying all this because uh, your apprentice is with us tonight, Ethan from IAIA. Hello, Ethan. So um, I'm really uh, grateful. This is uh, Ramona here. So. Uh, we're talking about film, which is amazing. It's almost like meeting somebody like Chip Livingston and talking to him and mentoring with him and finding out that he was a journalist for 10 years. And then he got the craft and the mechanics down. And then he started writing his own uh, material, everything from poetry to fiction to, I'm not sure about nonfiction, but he's an amazing writer now and he's giving it all back in that MFA program at IAIA to all of us who want to have it. And it feels like, you know, to me, you've been filmmaking and just amazing with your indigenous lenses and your the way you're putting it together. And now all of a sudden you're writing. You just you just got published, everybody. This is uh, Ramona's book, Shudder. Uh, published by uh, Soho Press Inc. and will be distributed by Penguin Random House. This is this is a big deal, man. This is huge. So before you tell us where we can purchase this and how we can get a hold of this book and how how you're starting a script to make it into a movie series, like everything you're talking about, um, where did you get your start in writing? Did it go hand in hand with the photography and filmmaking, or did you just join the program at IA and then took to it? How did that all come about? Uh, well, you know, I I think at best I'm a lazy writer. I've always have been. <laughs> and one of the first things I'll tell people when they ask me about, why did you want to be a writer? I don't want to be a writer. I hate writing. It was like one of the my most hated activities. I'm not joking. I hate writing. Um, but I'm good at it. <laughs> and um. I think I didn't really know that I was a decent writer um, until I think I was a senior in high school and um, my high school English teacher, Mr. Zuber, gave me an award, gave me the senior award for the best writer because I wrote this, we were supposed to write this essay about Sisyphus and about, you know, rolling the stone up the hill, but we wanted, he wanted us to give our own personal interpretation of what that is, the Sisyphean theory, right? And I kind of wrote this story about how I couldn't figure out how to write the essay and I went outside and smoked a cigarette, which I wasn't supposed to do. And then I went back inside and figured out I wrote the essay. Because it's all about like going to your lowest point before you're able to get back on the horse and push the stone back up the mountain and get it done. And so I kind of, and he told me, you are an excellent writer. You need to stop pretending that you're not an excellent writer. You do like the bare minimum to get your grade, but I know that you can do better. You just don't want to. And I told him like, yeah, like totally. I don't want to write. <laughs> I don't want to write this essay. And I'm not interested in doing any of this work, listening to Shakespeare and doing any of this. It's like super boring. And I was in Catholic school at St. Pius here in Albuquerque. So it was very intense like college preparatory stuff and I was just not into it but I knew at that point I was good at writing but I just never did it and I decided instead to write screenplays because they're easier and they're faster and you can tell a story very visually which I feel like I'm, I'm a very visual writer and so for me screenwriting was the way to go and I, I wrote a screenplay very um right after I got out of college um I wrote many essays about Sergei Eisenstein and, and like the UNM at that point was a very theoretical, the program was very theoretical. So you did a lot of film theory and you read a lot of books and you studied a lot of film. And so I, I was really good at that. And I could only get a job when I got out of college, I could not get a job in the film industry because at that point it was 1997 and there was no film industry in New Mexico. Um, so the first job I could get <laughs> 
um, I worked in a frame shop for a while, but the first shop, the first job I got working in video was for um, a gentleman named Jerry Goff, and he he ran a business called Goff Visual Services, and it was basically a private company that did forensics for the state of New Mexico, for the state police, for um, law firms. Um, you know, here in New Mexico, internationally, nationally, we process bank robbery videos. We um, filmed accident scenes. I videotaped depositions and, uh, you know, post-accident um, scene investigations and construction work. I mean, it's just insanity. And I spent 16 years doing that work. Um, and I, my boss was very <laughs> difficult. He was, you know... He could be nice and he was a very generous man. He would allow me to take equipment out of his studio to do our documentary. And that's, I think, the reason why I stayed working there for so long was because he gave me that opportunity to use the equipment and to use the editing and software that he had. And um, we were able to finish, I think, three films while I worked there um, just because we were able to get our own, get, you know, the camera equipment and do all the work there. Um, but after the third film, we were able to buy our own camera, and we started really getting to work on our work, and I started to slowly step away from the forensics, and eventually just quit completely. Um, I think it was probably like right, right as I was going in for the MFA program, I quit that job. Um, I just couldn't take it. My, my um, son was small, and my boss was just getting it even grumpier and my hours were crazy and I wasn't getting paid enough and I just had it. I was, I, and I needed, I knew that I could work for myself. I didn't need to work for him anymore. I worked for him for 16 years and I was just done and I quit and I went and applied for school. I actually, when I was still at Jerry's, I went to that Los Luceros work writing program that they had as part of the film, the film office. And um, I went to that program, and I, I think probably like six writing workshops with my mentor, Joan Toothfairy. And Joan, um, kind of in the process of writing, doing, you know, writing prompts and, and being in her class, I started to get a feel for actually writing again, something besides screenplays or grants, you know, but something more of a creative, like writing short stories. I hadn't done that since I was like in junior high. I mean, really. Um, so it, it just started blossoming <laughs> like a story at a time, like this, the very roots of Rita and her, her, her relationship with her grandmother. Like that part of the story was developing as little short snippets in Joan's uh, workshops. And I remember they made the announcement that IAIA was going to have this new MFA low res program. And I was like, oh, this is like the perfect program for me because I am, I got a business to run. I've got kid pick up at school. Like I'm too busy to go back to the university to get my master's degree. And I just didn't want to deal with all of that. But I thought this would be the way I could get my MFA um, and continue to work. So... <laughs> I asked Joan, I was applying for MFA in the screenwriting program, and I talked to my mentor, Joan, and Joan, Joan Tewksbury is a very famous author. She's written a few books, and she's the one who helped write Nashville. I don't know if you've ever seen that film, Nashville, but she wrote the screenplay. So, yeah, so Joan, I begged Joan to write me a letter of recommendation for IAIA, and she called me, and she said, Ramona, I, will, I would love to write you a letter of recommendation but I will only write it if you study fiction instead of screenwriting. And I, at first I was like, but Joan, why? I mean, like, and she was like, well, do you write screenplays? I was like, yeah. And she said, do you know how to write screenplays? I said, yeah. And she said, then why do you know we'll need to go get your MFA program? Why do you need to go do that? Like, that's a waste of two years. Just go and tell this story that you're telling. Like, keep telling this story. Um, and so I did, I started to write a little bit more and it was mostly just about the grandma and the Rita story, little snippets here and there of her growing up and that kind of thing. Um, but I had wanted to do a documentary, um, about Navajos who work, um, as police officers, like 
Navajo too have to deal with death, of course, because death is such a taboo thing for Navajo in, in Navajo culture. And I thought, well, what about Navajos who are police? Like, what do they do when they have a dead body? They're at work. Like, this is part of their job. Like, what about doctors? What about pathologists? What about, you know, like, there are people who are going to actively have to handle dead bodies, bodies, and they're, and some of them are going to be Navajo, maybe, because they're doctors or because they're officers or detectives or, you know, who knows? And I thought, what is that like for them? Like, what kind of thing do they go through to feel safe? Like, are, do they, maybe they just aren't traditional. Like, I started to think about, like, all of this stuff in my mind, and um, that idea I had for the documentary started to ooze into the story with the grandma because I started to think about some of the stuff that my grandma would tell me and I would I was like hmm because when I started working for foren in forensics like those first two years were super hard for me like I'd call my grandma all the time and I'd be like oh my god grandma I saw something today I know I'm not even supposed to be looking at that stuff and I have to do it though. I'm at work and she's like, you need to quit that job. She was like so bad that I was doing what I was doing. But I, and I thought, wow, all of this is playing in my head for a reason. Like, and I, I wanted to write a, I started to think, well, maybe I should write a book about this kind of stuff instead of trying to make a film about it because it would be much more interesting as a book. And then you could just make the character up and then you could just do whatever you wanted and so I applied to IAIA with the beginning of that story, which basically um, translated to one of the chapters where Rita takes the picture of the, the dead cat. So that was one of the early kind of things that I wrote in. And all the other stuff about the crime cases and all that stuff came later. But um, that was the initial thing that I got into IAIA with, was with that story. And they really enjoyed it. I got to get into the program um, the first year. And, and started from there. Um, and in the process, while I was at IA, I went to the APD CSI school. They have a 16 week class that you can take as a citizen in Albuquerque if you want to take it. You write an essay and you tell the police why, you want to, why you're interested in forensics and you take this class for 16 weeks. And um, you, know, you learn about everything about forensics. You learn about blood spatter, you learn about ballistics, you learn how to pull, pull a fingerprint. Um, you learn how to store evidence. You learn everything um, about how to process a scene. And um, so I took that, and then I took everything I had been researching for the documentary, and then I took this story about grandma and myself growing up and pulled some things from it and put it into Rita's story and, and started moving things around. And that, <laughs> that is what came out of it right there. <laughs> we got a request for you to read a portion of this. Do you have a favorite <laughs> spot that's nice and quick and short? The well, how, how about this? <laughs> I'll read this. And I'm not saying that any of this is like my favorite. I don't even know if I have a favorite, but um, but I think this chapter four, I, I'll read a little bit. And that I think it's good because I I think it kind of incorporates everything I was just telling you guys about, like how I incorporated my own observations and my own experiences into a fictional narrative, because I think chapter four kind of touches on some of the stuff I was telling you today. And it's not the, it's not the forensic part, but it's the part about the grandma and Rita and their relationship. Um, so I'll read a little bit from chapter four. It's called Paper in a Box. Um, the year I turned five, grandma taught me how to build a camera. It was also the first year that my grandpa began to visit me. At first, I didn't know it was him. My grandma, so heartbroken over his death, never kept a picture of him in our house. Grandma could make anything out of nothing. We had running water. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and that's how we lived together in her little house. We had running water and electricity, which was a lot out there on the res. Maybe gra my grandma had built her house with her own hands, with concrete and nails and tar paper shingles. Grandma loved to tell stories about how those Navajo women in the community would stare at her like she was crazy as she hammered her way on the shingles of her own roof and brought stones for her fireplace when the light had fallen low in the sky. The women had watched as grandma yelled at the young men from the hardware store who had done work on the house one weekend while she was away. She recounted the events over and over because I begged her to. 
Those fools put my garage on the wrong side, she would say, making me roll around in laughter. Who needs to look out of their kitchen window into their garage? Not me. In protest, my grandma never put a permanent floor in the garage. It just sat there with the same dirt floor that it always began with. One day, Rita, I'm moving my garage to the other side. You'll see, she would say. She would tickle my stomach and I would run away, the fresh laughter still working through my body. I wanted that garage on the right side too, just because that's what grandma wanted, even though I knew she could never afford to move it. On the, res on the reservation nestled deep within the Red Canyons and forgotten communities, tattered trailers and skeletons of long abandoned hogan stood like teeth. Hot sand ran into every crack and hole when the wind blew, and now only shells remained tied together with thinly stretched chicken wire and bare logs. Grandma had picked a good spot for her home site, hidden to shelter her house from the relentless east to west winds. Her home was a beacon of modern living nestled between territories preserved in times gone by. The mountains were at her front door, which faced north, and a dry riverbed made up the backyard. She liked to grow corn and squash, lettuce and radishes. She sat out in the summer sun with me in her salt shaker, and we would eat fresh radishes from the ground, washed free of dirt with the cool water from her green hose. Grandma and I used to take long walks into the dry riverbeds behind her house, looking for the long green Navajo tea stalks that peeked out of the sand. Before gathering the stalks, Grandma would pray in Navajo and sprinkle her yellow corn pollen on them. We had to thank the tea before we could use it. Don't take the whole thing, don't take it from the root. If you do, they won't be able to keep growing all summer, she lectured. Her hands were full of the light green stalks, their yellow flowers rising like unruly wires through her fingers. I pulled gently at the plant, leaving a healthy six inch stalk behind, and eventually I rolled the stems inside my dirty t-shirt. We walked for a couple hours before deciding to turn back, our legs sore from trudging in the deep sand. Grandma rolled her empty cloth to flower bags around her neck to keep her cool. As we made our way up the final hill, our pockets and shirts filled with tea, I could see beads of sweat on Grandma's face. Her face was red with labor. Never get old, she said. You hear? Okay, Grandma. Once home, we bent the tea into bundles and wrapped them with string. Grandma left the bundles out on the table to dry for a couple of days and then moved them to her copper tea canister. When she finally let me drink tea with her in the evening, she would stare at me with a smile and shake her head as I filled my tea with sugar cubes and milk from the can. Eventually, I convinced her to let me have morning coffee with her, sharing the off-white milk, sugar, and coffee concoction at the kitchen table. But on the day I before I turned five, Grandma and I drove deep into the woods towards the Chisco Mountain, on the other side of Tohatchee, where the blue spruce and aspen trees hissed only feet above the trail road. Our pickup shook and rattled along the way, and Grandma had loaded us up with a shovel and a shabby gunny sack, a tattered cotton sheet, and a black box. I knew the sheet and the gunny sack meant we were going to go up to the pinyon trees to get nuts to roast and sell. A good gunny sack full could make Grandma a little money here and there. I love pinyon nuts, freshly roasted from the oven. When Grandma roasted and salted the pinyon, the fish, the house filled with the smell of warmed pine sap. We found a good spot near the creek and made our way up. And when we came across the tall, stout pinyon tree, its cones full of brown berries, I worked myself up the branches and shook the tree with all the strength I had in my arms and legs. Grandma spread her white cotton sheet below and sat, quietly sorting through the pine needles to find the nuts. In the Navajo way, she explained, you aren't supposed to shake the branches like you did just now. My feet braced weight above the needles and branches. When the pinyon's ready, it'll fall to the ground by itself. You're being impatient. She shook her head. Doing it like that calls the bears to you. Ah, but they'd have to get through me. Bears no, bears no better than to bother your grandma. The meat is too tough. I pulled Thank my you. Okay. Oh, <laughs> gosh. Stop me. I, I can read. I can that's, read. <laughs> that's some really good writing. That's just filling out the, there's interiority, exteriority, the dialogue. Um, what's good? Uh, for me, myself, I, li I like a lot of interiority. I like to hear what's going on in people's mind with the action on the outside happening with drops of dialogue. So really good work. Awesome. <laughs> Unfortunately, was, sadly, we're out of time. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just thank you for your wonderful show tonight. I want to tell everybody 
uh, where they can buy this book from. Uh, yes. Where do we get it? Just Google it. <laughs> well, it's not out yet. Wow. It's, it's, you got you got one of the advanced editions nice. <laughs> that probably has like a couple of spelling errors of the Navajo words. So like <laughs> after that, it got copyrighted one more time. So, um, but the the book comes out on August second, and you can pre-order it now. Like you can go to, um, you know, I don't know about Bezos. Don't give your money to Amazon, but you can find like your 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 local bookstore or Barnes and Noble, somebody like that, and you can order it online pre-order so if you just type shutter and ramona emerson in the penguin site should come up and it allows it'll direct you to where you can pre-order the book beautiful okay everybody orders from ramona don't order from amazon order from anybody <laughs> else and ramona is definitely the local serve the local coffee shops and the family-owned businesses okay. and since we're at the end of our show our our our, our theme is uh um, thriving in purpose. So just give us one last definition for our little brother out there who's watching the show tonight, student at IAIA and all these other artists out there. What does thriving in purpose mean to you? Hmm. Thriving in purpose. Well, I think, I think what it is, is to, is to never lose sight of your dream and your goal. Um, because there are going to be times out in your life, especially as an artist, where you're going to be rejected, and believe me, I know all about that. <laughs> and um, I've been rejected from rejected from just about every film festival, every funding organization possible, some multiple times. Twenty eight to thirty different publishers also rejected this book. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie, there's times when I was like, "What am I doing? I should just go get a job or just start teaching because." I need to have like a real job. I need to be an adult <laughs> and not try to do this artist crap. But I think like, I just remember my grandma telling me like, if that's what you really want to do and you really believe in it, then that must be what you were meant to do. And you can't just give up because somebody said no to you. When, since when does that even happen? It doesn't. If somebody says no to you, you just go around that person and find somebody else and, um, you know, find another organization that got your best interest at heart. So, yeah, don't give up. Just remember, like, whatever it is that drives you. Like, for me, it was my son. Like, I would see him and I'd be like, I don't want him thinking I'm just a loser. <laughs> like, I don't want him to think that I didn't fight hard um, to, to, to do what I'm doing. And um, so... Keep fighting, man. Don't give up on those dreams. It, it took me 25 years to get to the point where somebody is finally interested in something I'm doing. Wow. And, um, you know, so don't give up. Well, we're always interested in what you're doing, Ramona. We are your biggest fans, Indigenous <laughs> Ways and Indigi Fam, because you're an awesome, uh, legitimate, loyal, the dependable person that suits up and shows up, even if it's across state lines. You, you show up for the shot, for the shoot. So thank you. Okay, well, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Elena. Right on. Thanks so much for that, Ramon. Great, great words. Just before we uh, invite all our Zoomsters in and getting our social media people, if you want to ask a question or throw out a comment, please do in the chat box. But just a bit of a commercial break. Uh, our wonderful wisdom circle where we're at at the moment is going on hiatus. Um, and we will be reconvening in the third week of October. Uh, why is that? Because for the next five months, from May through to September, every third Wednesday of the month, we have the Indigenous uh, Ways Festival. Uh, different parks around Santa Fe. It is in person and it is also going to be online. So for those people who aren't living in the vicinity around Santa Fe, you can also beam in instead of being one hour, six to seven mountain time, it'll be uh, six to eight mountain time. And if you're in person, it's starting at five. We've got all the activities. 
uh, that will be from five to uh, six before we bring the main audience in. Uh, we are really, really jazzed about this. We've got artisans, food vendors, and the whole point of this is how do we bring our beloved community out uh, two years after being, after uh, two years of whatever we've gone through. Uh, so we're really grateful. You can check out on our website, indigenousways.org, all the, all the uh, schedule is there. And importantly, it's a different Zoom link. So if you want to, if you want to attend on the virtual, go up to our website, indigenousways.org, and there you'll be able to register for the virtual event. Down below, you'll see all our social media zipping across the screen. We're really grateful for that. And then if you want to catch Ramona again, you can in, a next, uh, in the next week, have a look on our website. There you'll see Ramona's archive as well as the 165 Indigenous and Native American uh, presenters that we've been very blessed to have through the circle starting April the 1st. Uh, 2020. Um, and then, you know, all of these events have been free. All of them since April the 1st, 2020 have had ASL interpreters, and that's making access available to everyone. Uh, so kudos to Chris Esiano, who's interpreting now, and also the beautiful Zoll, who's blessed us uh, making access available um, now. Also want to give a shout out for our series that we've had, which is just finishing tonight with the beautiful Ramon. Thank you to our Ramona. sponsors, Ramona. Thank you to our sponsors, the National Endowment of Humanities, uh, the New Mexico Humanities Council, Westaf, New Mexico Arts, the National Endowment of the Arts, uh, Northern Rio Grande National Heritage Area, also to all our individual donors, making this possible so people can come in with no cost at all. Thank you to our board members and all of those wonderful people out there. Uh, if you want to make a donation, you can. You can uh, do our little sites here, go to our website, uh, or else we've got our postal there. So this is that wonderful time. If you're in, if you're in um, our Zoom area and you want to turn on your camera, now is the time to do that. Tash, I'll let you um, have a go at this. Okay. Wonderful. So our Wisdom Circle, I'm thinking, is not ending. The only thing you have to do is go to our website, zoom in. We will have our beautiful sister, Ramona, and uh, our, our young brother, uh, Ethan, on site live filming and right now i want to say hello to our beautiful founder of indigenous ways carol harvey carol harvey, carol harvey. this is carol carol is a, a writer she's a lawyer she's an activist she's navajo she's uh from her family or from luca chukai would you like to say anything to ramona this evening carol we got no no vocals we need you to unmute Most importantly, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can hear you. I know your grandma, Ramona. <laughs> <laughs> Too awesome. Too incredibly awesome to see her granddaughter here in front of me reading a story about a person that I know and love. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Your story was so beautiful. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad that you knew my grandma. Not, there's hardly anybody that knows my grandma anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. Good to see you. All thank right. You. I, I just want to do a plug too for Carol. Carol recently uh, to uh, authored her new book as well. So congratulations on that. Uh, as well, Carol, and such a wonderful little small world we live in. All right. So who wants to say hi to Carol? We've got oh, a couple well, it's of Ramona uh, or Carol. I mean, to Ramona. Sorry, <laughs> we're going to have Carol, you guys. We're going to have Carol. Would anybody like to say anything tonight? Ke Terry Vincent, TV. All right. Yo, what's up, Terry? Harry here saying hi, Arlita. Hi, Christina Bueno. Hi, Tosh and Elena. Hi. 
uh, Ramona, I was so fascinated by your story. And 25 years to get there, wow, that is a lot of endurance and tenacity to make it there. And also, it's very much thankfully to your grandmother for continuing to encourage you. And now you are serving as an inspiration for me. Uh, so just wow. Thank you, Ramona. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Very Thank impressive. You so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. And a real quick yes, plug yes. for TV. TV teaches American Sign Language. She will be one of our presenters at our Indigenous Ways Festival. Acronym is IWF. So if you want to learn sign language, go to our website and see when Terry's going to be at the park. 15th of uh, June. Okay, Terry will be June 15th. She'll be teaching American Sign Language. So please join uh, Terry Vincent on that time. Uh, our sister Arletta and Luca Chukai, would you like to say something, Arletta? And Rodney. Yate, Navajo Deaf Way. This is our leader speaking. And our leader says, I want to order your book. Yeah, I would like to order your book. And I would like to have it in my possession. I'd like to have a copy of it. Well, Tosh, we got to get her a copy. <laughs> Arletta, I will read this and I'll lend it to you, okay? And then when her book comes out, you can have okay. it. I'll buy you one, Arletta, because you're my best friend. So cool. Arletta's an avid reader, Ramona. Okay. She's in uh, Luka Chigai, been unplugged, uh, old way, indigenous way, Navajo way, firewood, and oh, kerosene lamps, and <laughs> beautiful, and Rodney too. So uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get Terry a book for sure. All right, who else wants to talk tonight? I'm just so honored to hear Ramona and that generation. You know, it's such a different exposure to me because, you know, I didn't grow up with all of that, you know, new stuff that it's wonderful to hear about and to hear about our younger generation of Indigenous persons expanding their horizons and that, no, you don't have to be put in any box and you get to do your own work. And it's such an honor for me um, to hear from your generation and to hear your story. And so uh, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, I, I really, um, now that I'm getting a little older, it's very important for me to make sure that that next generation is ready to take over. You know, it's a young person's game, the, the film industry. And, but these young people who, are in their 20s and 30s always blow me away with their knowledge of technology. And these young people are making films with one of these now <laughs> and getting them into film festivals. And, you know, I've, I'm used to carrying like 500 pounds of gear out to the boonies to do stuff. And now these young people are, are able to use this and their laptop and tell stories around the world. and it just makes storytelling so much easier for everyone. And uh, also it makes it so much easier for us to see them and to see their new viewpoints and see what they're going through as young people. Um, you know, it's, it's an important part of how our native people are going to be seen in the future. Beautiful. All right, beautiful, Ramona. Those are wise words to uh, finish on with the beautiful Ramona. We're about up the top of the hour. Uh, I just want to take this time to thank all our people who have come in live, whether that be in Zoom or our social media. Uh, Amy Lafferty says, hi, Ramona. So uh, thank you for all those people that took the time out of their time to bless us. If you're watching the recording of us, thank you so much. Um, also to our ASL interpreters again, Zol and also Crescesiano making it possible. We will look forward to seeing you all either virtually or at in the park uh, May the 18th, that's Wednesday, at the Indigenous Ways Festival. Other than that, everyone, let's give a big, warm, hearty yahoo for the one and only... Woo! 
Ramona! Take Yee-hoo! care, everybody. We'll, be, we'll see you soon. Take care. Touch the earth.